thing, automation. You know, like, like Nest or um, LifeX or any of these other home automation brands that are all dependent on open, opening their app to do something, I don't consider that automation because it's not. Because you as a human are telling it what to do. Um, and so I'm going to talk about how you can actually build real automation flows within Home Assistant and Node-RED um, to um, go way beyond what you could ever do with some of these proprietary um, solutions. So um, Home Assistant, it is Apache 2.0 license, so again, a real open source license. Um, it is real automation, um, not uh, some stupid app that you have to tell it do everything. Um, it prioritizes local control and privacy, so it always, when, when it adds a new feature, it is always um, keeping that in mind of how, um, how can this be local and local control, so not dependent on the cloud um, or dependent on someone else's server. Um, it keeps all data local, thereby keeping private, and as of uh, this month, there was um, over 1,400 components supported today. Um, so one of the big things that once you start going down the road of actually doing home automation is you get to detect when you're home because you want certain things to happen when you're home versus when you're not home. Um, and there's a couple different ways of what type of area do you want? Do you want when you're near home, when you're at home, or when you're at the room level, or even down to the part of the room level? So um, on the GPS, this could be your phone. Um, there's a Home Assistant app on um, that you can install on Android or iOS that will report via, um, hold on, uh, via report over MQTT back to your controller where your GPS location is. And you can draw a map within Home Assistant saying, if I enter this circle, do X, Y, Z. Um, your car, the, um, there are, um, Tesla has an API um, that you can basically gain the location of your Tesla based um, by doing an API call to uh, Tesla's servers. And so you can thereby tell where, you're, at least where your car is and presumably where you are based on the location of your car. Um, BMW, I think, is also has the same thing. Um, the on your car part is very dependent on which manufacturer you have. So it is in beta with, it is supposed to be released in the next month or so or less. Okay. Potentially, um, you know, m maybe you don't want it um, draining on the battery. It may, it may not check in as fast, so maybe you only have it on a 30-minute pulse cycle. Um, or you just don't want to allow outside access because for the Android app to work, you got to either use Nabakasa, which I'll get to that, um, or you have to open up the firewall rules um, at your house to allow the cell phone app to communicate directly with your home install. Um, so... Then there's present detection whether you're at home. So there is Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Um, you can also use motion sensors on the Wi-Fi. Um, if you use um, like the Unify system, it can, can Home Assistant can connect to the API, um, Unify's API, and say, all right, this device, so like my cell phone, is connected to the wireless, so he's probably at home. Um, and the Bluetooth, it can use um, passive Bluetooth um, detection um, like a um, like a Raspberry Pi with a Bluetooth stick. So it can basically say, um, if I detect this Bluetooth MAC address just beaconing um, nearby, then his phone's probably home. Um, room level, you can do cameras. So you can um, do object recognition using the cameras. So it'd be like if you see me using Facebox, so you can actually do facial recognition, um, you say, if I'm in this room, do X, Y, Z. Um, there's motion detection, and if you use Bluetooth LE um, with Bluetooth LE beacons, um, you can actually get down to um, you know sub meter, sub yard um, um, resolution on the detecting within the room level. So, 
hardware, this is a big one in home, in home automation, is who do you go with? Do you go with a big name like Google, Nest, Who, Hue, or Amazon? Um, based on their current track record and what they've done in the past, I would say hell no. Um, they typically are um, limited APIs, if any, or if you have Nest products, they discontinue the API and shut down public access to the API and only allow Google products to ac access said, said API. So if you bought a Nest device like I have, they will disappear out of Home Assistant because Google decided to discontinue the API. Um, what is even better than these big brands? And I'll list some of them. Um, there's the um, wide light, bu light bulbs. Um, these are generally devices that um, are Wi-Fi, so you don't have to deal with Zigbee or um, Z-Wave. There's no bridge required. They connect directly to your Wi-Fi. Um, they have local access, so they have some type of local API on them, so they don't require cloud connection. Um, the I have I personally have uh, the um, TP-Link um, um, switches, and they work really great. Um, there's um, you don't have to you don't have to fool with any authentication. Um, they just come up on your network, and you you put in the IP address of the device, uh, of the switch or light bulb or whatever in Home Assistant, and it will t and it will be able to turn it on or off. Um, the the um, the LifeX brand of light bulbs, um, the Unify cameras and APIs, or the cameras and the APs. Um, these again have local control if you're running the local um, server. So um, it, you can pull up the cameras within Home Assistant. You can um, use the um, APs for present detection. So when someone is home, again. Um, the Shelly devices are actually really cool and they just came out on the market about a year ago. But um, from my understanding, the company got fed up with having, the founder got fed up with having to flash other people's hardware to gain local control. Um, and he wanted a device that just works out of the box. So Shelly has produced a wide range of devices, everything from smoke detectors to um, LED strip controllers, that's what the RGB is, um, humidity sensors, plugs, outlets, and relays. Um, and the Shelly devices out of the box support MQTT. Um, and so all you have to do is put in the MQTT server that you run on your network into the interface on the Shelly device and it immediately starts working. Um, there's no flashing um, of the hardware, there's no opening it up. Um, and generally they are based on the 8266 um, Arduino chip. Um, and then Roku devices. Um, with when you add a Roku device into um, Home Assistant, you can tell when it's playing something. You can control it remotely because Roku has a, um, it listens on an, um, a socket on the local device. And if you send, you can send it commands to up arrow, down arrow, open Netflix, close Netflix, um, um, open YouTube. Um, and so once you can get that level of control within a device, you can now start automating it. And I'll get to some examples later. Um, hardware part two. This is where I name and shame. Um, Iris by Lowe's. It was a, um, I believe a Z-Wave or Zigbee based system and they had a central hub. Um, beginning of this year, they announced that um, they were no longer selling the devices and the cloud controller is being shut down. Um, and so if you have the devices, they will literally stop all functionality this year. Um, they, in the announcement, they promised to make it open source. I don't know if that's actually come to fruition. Um, and they, they promised to um, do some type of rebate program. I don't know if that actually came to fruition. So this is one example of a cloud a cloud-based system failing you because the um, host company b behind it decided to shut it down. There's the Harmony devices. Um, Logitech um, had, um, had slash has, because they, they keep going back and forth on this one, but basically some of their devices um, would listen on the local interface and you, would al you were allowed to send it commands over the interface. They then pushed an update down to the devices um, that improved security 
by turning off this local access. Um, and they, they had to walk it back. At one point, you had to install a beta um, firmware, but if you installed the beta firmware, it would bring the device out of compliancy, so they would no longer honor a warranty. There's, um, this is another example of a, a brand that needs to be named and shamed um, on their device. Um, then, then there's the IKEA devices. Um, they are a Zigbee-based hub and bridge system. So it, um, they sell a lot of inexpensive, like door sensors, window sensors, motion sensors, um, things like that. Um, even though um, Home Assistant doesn't use an official API, um, IKEA's uh, software arm is aware of the use um, that um, Home Assistant is using this API, and they w made a they were making a chain, a breaking, um, IKEA was making a breaking change to this API. Um, and they actually gave Home Assistant the heads up, going, we're making this change. Here's what you need to do to work on the new API. So even though it's not an official, the, um, Home Assistant is not using an official API, there is that cooperation between the vendor and Home Assistant. Um, there's Weather Underground. Um, Weather Underground used to have a public API that you could pull weather information, including if you had a, if you had your own local hardware that was using, that was reporting up to Weather Underground. After they closed the public API, you can no longer get the data of your own device from we um, Weather Underground, thereby another failing of the cloud and the, cl um, the devices that depend on cloud connectivity. Um, and then there's Nest. I already mentioned earlier about them um, closing their API um, to public access. Um, uh, I believe it goes into effect in August. So it's uh, yet, yet w one more example of a big company failing um, the hobbyist and DIY community with wanting local control, um, not wanting everything to be um, cloud-based. Um, there's building your own devices. Um, Right here I have a, um, it's a multi-sensor, so um, it does temperature, humidity, it does a motion sensor, it's got a light sensor and an infinite colored LED, cost 30 bucks. No soldering, no coding required. Um, and then you can put this in about whatever case you want. Um, what I've heard of people using, um, do you know those um, boxes that you put your soap in when you're traveling? You know, it's like a $2 box. Put this in it. Um, all you have to do is um, stick it in there and then um, hot glue the sensors. Um, it doesn't have to be fancy. I mean, now if you, if you have access to a 3D printer, then you can absolutely make you a nice case. And um, in this GitHub link, um, he does publish um, 3D um, drawings so you can print your own case for this. Um, and I actually will show you the sensor. Ah, crap. So um, here's Home Assistant. Um, I've moved all of my other objects. God, that resolution sucks. Um, I moved all my other objects out, so it's just this. Um, and you can manually turn it and you can see that the LED just lit up. Um, you can change its color um, to basically anything in the rainbow um, and it will change it in real time. Um, you wouldn't really use this interface for your day-to-day -day activities of interfacing with this. What you could use this to do is for your testing and development of, um, I want this to be this color. You can select it off the color wheel and find out that what its hex code is and use that hex code in your automation to program that. Um, so, you know, you can turn, y you can have it set so that when it flashes red, it means this. When it flashes blue, it means this. When it flashes green, it means this. Um, you can see it's got a motion sensor right here. Um, see how it detected motion. Um, so um, it's got light. Um, sensor so you can tell whether the, um, let's say you want to have program that when it's dark you have lights automatically come on, but when the sun comes up you want the lights to go off. Um, you can use this little um, light um, sensor and then you also get your temperature humidity. It's 70 degrees, it's 70% humidity, so it's a little muggy in here. Um, 
And so there is, let's see. Ah, crap. So there's installing Home Assistant. Um, there's something called HASS.io, which is a easy way to set up Home Assistant um, on um, any device because it, it bundles the operating system, Docker, and all the containers needed to get Home Assistant up and running with virtually no install required. Yes? Oh, is it too bright? Um, so, um, so HASS.io is about the easiest way to get started. Um, they produce Raspberry Pi images, um, and they also produce um, one-line installers for a, um, if you already have an existing um, Debian or Ubuntu type device, it's a one-liner um, one install which will um, install Docker, it will install all the dependencies, it will download the HASS.io con containers, start it all up and configure everything with one line. Um, you can, if you already have an existing um, like Kubernetes cluster or Docker Swarm, you can, throw, you can throw Home Assistant and its dependencies within it. Um, Python virtual environments, I don't know much about that, but um, that is one of the install options. Um, there's also um, FreeNAS and Synology have um, one-click installers. Um, so you can do it from within those UI, those NAS UIs. It's a one-click install for Home Assistant. I will warn you, um, the add-ons can be quite addicting. Um, and because there are a ton of add-ons. Um, here are what comes in the official and um, community um, things. So there's everything from, you know, you can do DHCP, DNS, duck DNS. Um, you can put... You can do um, Git on it, um, Lex, Let's Encrypt. Um, you can do local um, AI, or not local AI, sorry, local voice control. So if you want to build your own Alexa device um, but not use the Amazon product that's always listening, you can build your own using this. Um, and all of these add-ons get installed in a separate Docker um, container so that it doesn't cause problems um, or doesn't conflict with Home Assistant. And it makes it for a pretty stable environment. Um, and you can just see there's a ton of options, including Node-RED, um, which is one I use and I use pretty exten extensively. Um, and there's like 0T1. Um, and I think there was also the WireGuard is in here too. Um, so it, and Plex, and it makes, these, makes installing these add-ons very easy. The downside with add-ons is they can really tax a, res tax a system. So a, just a bare bones home assistant without any add-ons or few add-ons can run on a Raspberry Pi. And, and that's where it got its genesis is um, you would download um, the SD card image, you would throw it on a Pi and it would get started. Um, but as you start adding more and more add-ons, they become more and more CPU dependent and the biggest where the pies have some re um, reliability is on the SD card. Almost invariably within a year you will burn a um, SD card. So I generally recommend you can try it out on a pie if you, if you love it. Move it over to um, something with real storage like um, it could be an old laptop, it can be an old desktop, um, it could be a Nook. Um, those are real popular. Um, just something with a real storage, not an SD card. Um, so here's some um, examples of what you can do with real home automation. Um, there's the fire service in Australia will produce polygons on a um, KMZ, um, which can be imported into Google Earth. But um, these polygons will, will be areas where a wildfire is in danger of burning up, you know, like um, like there's a wildfire already going and these are the areas that it will be next. Well, you can tell Home Assistant to cons consume these polygons and when your address is within the polygon or near the polygon, you can then trigger actions. And these actions could be, you know, turn on your sprinkler system outside because just, just wetting the ground can keep the fire from 
creeping up on the dead grass that, that you have outside. It can, you can tell um, if you have motorized shutters, it will lower the shutters. It will turn on the sprinklers on the roof so that the embers that land on the roof don't actually burn up. Um, and it can send you a notification that this is all happening. And, um, and let, let's say you have a um, gasoline pump that pumps off your pool water to feed all these sprinklers. You can turn that on automatically. This is all without any human intervention, uh, entirely automatic. And another is home fires. Um, home, home fires at night when people are sleeping are particularly dangerous because A, you don't know about it, and B, by the time you know about it, um, the house is heavily smoked and all your lights off, so you can't see anything. Well, if the, let's say the smoke detector detected a fire, it would first turn on every light in the house um, after, after it starts sirening, it would turn on every light in the house and outside so that everything is lit up so it makes it easier to get out. It will, you, you could tell it to turn off the air conditioning so you're not spreading smoke around the entire house so you try to keep it contained. Um, if you put a solenoid on your gas line, y you can tell the system to turn off your gas service to the house so that there's not a risk of an explosion or the gas service feeding the fire more intently. Um, let's say you have a gate at the end of your driveway, you, you can tell the home, as home assistant to open that gate so that when the fire trucks come, they, can, they don't have to wait for you to go open the gate. And, this, and all of this can be entirely automatic. And um, another one which might seem small is stop, stopping and starting your Roomba. Um, let's say you have a um, Roomba or some other Wi-Fi connected automated vacuum. Um, but they're real noisy, so you don't want you don't want it running at night. You don't want it. Uh, you also don't want it running when you're at home, and so um, you can have it detect using the like the Wi-Fi is okay. You know, me and my wife are gone right now. Um, I'm going to turn off the motion sensors for the security system so that Roomba doesn't activate it. It. Um, you're going to then turn on the Roomba to let it start working. But oh no, someone someone came home. Um, so you tell the Roomba, all right. Go away. Stop. Turn off. Go away. Go back in. Um, another one is going to bed. You know, when you go to bed, there's a lot of things that you do. You know, whether it's closing blinds, whether it's uh, locking the doors, turning lights off, um, maybe setting the coffee pot, you know, setting your own alarm. You can basically tell the home automation, all right, it's time to go to bed. And then it does all these actions for you. Um, another one is getting up in the morning. Um, it interfaces with Waze or Google Maps, so it can gain an estimate on your travel time. And so if there's a really bad accident on like the interstate and it's going to add 30 minutes to your commute, well, you can tell Home Assistant, all right, set my alarm 30 minutes earlier so that, and t turn the coffee pot on 30 minutes earlier so that, and it will get you up 30 minutes earlier so that you can get out the door and still make it to work in time. So once you can start interfacing with all these different components, you can, um, you can start growing what the problems you could solve with. Um, is that the last slide? That should be. Oh, yeah, that is the last slide. So th th those are the, some examples of what real automation is, not pulling out your app and telling it to do something. Thank you. Yes. I saw there that you had three nine integrated. Basically, you can run it as a virtual machine or as a container inside three nine. Yes. And how exactly can you load that with plugins? In other words, will it be challenged if you start adding too many plugins? Less likely because typically if you have a free NAS box, it, it's an x86 box with real RAM and real storage. So that's typically not a problem. And it also depends on what your plugins are. If your plugins are very light, it's fine. If you're wanting to do Facebox or TensorFlow, which is doing image recognition, um, then yes, that can be a lot more intense on the CPU and memory. So it, it really depends on what plugins you want and what problems you're trying to solve. No, I'm not familiar with that. If it's open source, then it's probably already integrated. I think there's an integration already in Home Assistant. I'm trying to look at it now. For Microsoft, if I remember correctly, I think I looked at that once. It's 
seems like it would be a natural like it's like yeah. imagination. Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't know what it's like to avoid something like this. So um here's yeah, here's the voice integrations that it supports. Yeah. Uncroft is supported. Um, and so as you can see, there's a there's a very healthy list of automations that you can that you can do. One of the automations is um, um, if you're on if you are in a data, uh, let's say you have a limitation on how much you can download. One of the one of the plugins can be that um, your ISP produces an API that tells you how much you've downloaded. You consume that API, and when you're getting near your limit, you tell transmission to stop downloading. Yeah, I've not I've not played with those systems. Um, I believe it's Facebox is one of the most common ones, um, and I believe it can um, consume a RSTP stream. That th those are the um, yeah. See, there's um, Facebox there. There's TensorFlow. There's um, some Amazon. Um, there's um, cloud um, systems and. Um, those are just dependent on what those accept. So and, and some of these might just be that on site it consumes a JPEG and sends that JPEG up to Microsoft for image processing. Yes? You mentioned starting on Raspberry Pi and the possibility of how far you can remove the custodian automation configuration of Pi moving that. They do have a backup and restore functionality. Um, I did it um, about six months ago um, when it was a much earlier version, and it broke mine, and I, didn't, and I ended up having to restart. Yeah. Um, I, will, I will say um, there's um, Paulus, who is the main developer. Um, he was actually hired by Ubiquity for about a year and a half, um, and Ubiquity paid his salary so that he could work full-time on Home Assistant, and in the past year, the it has been almost a night and day with the features, the stability, and the um, progress of the code. Um, he is no longer with Ubiquity. He is now with a company called uh, Nabacasa. Um, Nabacasa is a cloud proxy um, and the ter um, caretaker of Home Assistant. So what the Nabacasa cloud allows you to do is it will act as a um, proxy, but it due to the end-to-end -end encryption, it can't see any of the traffic, but using their Nabokasi cloud, you do not have to open up ports um, in your firewall. You don't have to deal with certificates or port forwarding, um, and it, it's a you know checkbox type configuration on your local home assistant, and due to the end-to-end -end encryption, they can't actually peer into the traffic. And I, I, thi I think it's like five bucks a month, so it's not bad. Yeah, Jim? Yeah, it's um, it is a one um, one liner install on those, and it will set up the Docker environment and download all the containers um, th using the HASIO um, system. Um, I if you don't want to deal with Docker, then you can do it as a Python virtual environment. Um, but the vast majority of people um, use HASIO because it's just so easy. And, and 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 that's what I run. I, I run it as a VM. Um, I have a bare bones Ubuntu VM that it runs within. Um, and um, if you attended my tiny home um, talk, um, we are um, planning on building a. Um, um, I call it the full size home. Um, the end of this year, or early next year, and one of the things I plan on doing is running Ethernet to every door, running and every window. I'm going to put door sensors on every door and on the windows so that I can tell when they're up and down. I'm also going um, to do roller blinds, automatic roller blinds on all the, all the windows. Um, every room will have temperature and humidity using one of these, motion using one of these, um, and even the RGB LED so that I can 
help the um, basically use it as a communication method for the system to communicate with me. Yes. So a lot of that it depends on what you want to use. So you can use cameras, or you can use Bluetooth, um, or there's some um, a few other techniques. But it, it, it it's really like for Bluetooth to work, you've got to have your phone on you. So it's not going to detect you if you don't have your phone. Now um, they do have Bluetooth LE beacons that are like about yay big that um, I've heard people clipping them to their pet's collars so they know where their pet is within the house so that the pet doesn't trigger the motion sensors on the alarm system. On that, on that topic, though, how do you sense it? In other words, you have to be near it. How, where do you put the sensor in order to detect it? So um, you can use Bluetooth LED be beacons, which have a very limited range, and your phone, w um, the, your phone would detect the Bluetooth beacon oh. and say, I am near this beacon and they would tell home assistant that, and, and you have assigned that beacon to a room. Okay, so you have to, and I was hoping that there was a way to put something in each room or two of them that would triangulate there is, um, there is a system that uses um, uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi to help triangulate. Um, I've not looked too much into it, um, but there is a way of doing that, but it's... N it's not super accurate. It's the the most accurate way is to go with um, e motion detection, Bluetooth, LE, or um, some cameras. And there's also um, you can enable um, ba something Bayon sensors, but basically you um, it determines the probability that something is true. So you can connect a Bluetooth sensor, the Wi-Fi sensor and a motion sensor all together and going, if all of these sensors agree that I'm in a room, the odds is probably pretty close to 100% that I'm in that room. And you can put a threshold going, all right, if the threshold's over 80%, then do this automation. But if the, th if the threshold is under 80%, then there's not enough agreement or enough confidence that I'm in this, that I'm in this room. And, and, and you can use those sensors to do like, it, if you want to determine how y you know whether you're cooking or not, it'd be like you you can detect if the um, hood fan is on. You can detect if there's been a large spike in your power draw because of your electric oven. You can detect whether the light in the kitchen is on. And if all three conditions are true, you probably are cooking. And so y y you can use multiple sensors to come to a conclusion about something. They're, they're, they range, um, I, I, I've not personally looked into them, um, but I believe they're sub-20. And, and they're very low power, so they, they get a decent lifetime. So they have a little uh, phone battery. Yeah, yeah. I have two trust employees over there. Ah, okay. It's interesting to me to be able to try and do it. My, my boss takes me to testify about wake up and automate some of the nocturnal needs. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, 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 there, there's people that have installed a pressure sensor between the box spring and the mattress, and if there's pressure there, then there's probably someone in the bed. So then, th then you can write a nomination if, all right, if I'm still in the bed and the alarm is going off, keep the alarm going and disable the snooze button because I probably need to get my ass out of bed. Or just turn on the sprayer. The, oh, the sprayer. <laughs> I would take a look at one of these on this screen um, w with Facebox probably being the one I'd start with because basically, it's, is this a human? Great, there's a human in the room. There's a, I don't know if it is, but there's a project called Yolo. Have you heard of that? I'm not familiar with that. And it will, it's amazing. You see the demo there? People, cats, dogs, birds, cars, anything. 
Yeah, and then, um, there's a lot of um, good examples, and, and the longer these integrations have been alive, the better the online examples and documentation. And there's a, um, there's a wrath of Home Assistant config files on GitHub, because a lot of people will publish their entire um, configuration online, because um, it has the um, capability of putting all your secrets in a separate file, um, and so you can just reference, you know, like dots um, or asterisk secret and reference it in another document so that you can openly publish your entire configuration. <laughs> so yeah, so, so something like that could possibly be a way to integrate. There's a lot of, but I've looked at a lot of it, and there's some other automations being able to identify, first off, if it's a human or something else, but then like you said, with the face, and I've definitely checked out, to identify that Lauren's walking around at this point, I can then trip specific automations for her. Yes. Yeah, that I don't know if the APIs are, I don't know how public any APIs are or not, but I know also um, some of the Wi-Fi mesh networks are starting to do like human detection. But again, that you can you can use 5 gigahertz to do that pretty accurately. I know um, Plume has a bunch of security system stuff built in to detect humans. So that you can be like, oh, hey, you know, when I click that thing, it's going to turn on. Yeah. But yeah, th there are a ton of integrations and... You know, I, I would recommend before you buying a device, come on here and see, you know, see if it's integrated um, already out of the gate. And odds are it probably is. Um, you know, the one of one of the ones I'm using for my energy is um, where is it? Um, I don't see. It's probably under somewhere else. Um, but it's um, Open Energy Monitoring. It's a company out of the UK that um, has an open uh, API. Um, or here you can actually get your Duke bill. So if you're in Duke territory like I am, you can um, access their um, API. So you just, you just use your Duke username and password and it will go out there and fetch your um, electric and um, gas meter usage. And so y you could be like, you know, I'll power, um, power use is too high this month. Honey, I'm, turning the, I'm, I'm gonna turn the AC off for you. Um, this, um, like in the case of like Duke, it would be de dependent on what level of um, information that they publish through the API. Um, and it looks like um, yesterday's information is not published until mid-morning. And But some of these others, um, like what I'm using, um, and um, there was another one I saw that, um, like the scents are real-time because they actually sit... Um, they use CT clamps on your power conductors so they can do real time. Yeah, they, 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 they measure the voltage and amperage and they calculate how many watts you're using in real time. So I, I, I can tell based on the power spikes when the oven is on, when the dryer is on, when air conditioning comes on, when the refrigerator comes on because there's, there's every one of them spikes. Yes. So um, he actually has an entire video um, on building this sensor. Um, don't use his code. Um, he talks about doing this all um, 
and using the Arduino KDE or IDE, don't do that. Um, what you want to use is um, um, ESP Home. Um, ESP Home directly integrates with Home Assistant and um, it allows you to, here's your entire configuration for this device. This is, there's no code. You just, you just drop this in, change a couple values based on names, um, and I can actually show you what it looks like um, in um, HomeLib. So here, here are the devices, and here's actually the actual speaker lights in the demo. Um, it, this system allows you to remotely um, push new firmware to these um, ESP devices. Um, there's no custom, um, there's no custom coding, um, and even using these, this particular example, there's not even any soldering, because I just hate soldering. And yes. Yes. So there's one system that I saw a demo from um, CES, and they use cameras, but the system itself will convert the human form into stick figure, and it will re it will save the stick figure. So so it's not an it's not it's not the violation of privacy that having cameras inside would be, and it has algorithms such that it detects sudden falls or um, laying down on the floor, which would be unnatural, um, and then can send alerts. And then um, if you have a caretaker, that it could it would send them the video of the stick figure, so you can see the stick figure walking, trip, fall, and they're still laying on the ground. Um, at which point, you then you can then go go help. But there there are a lot of cool technologies that are coming out, and hopefully, they get the message that. Open APIs, local control, and privacy are important. Anything else? Well, thank you for coming to my talk.